الله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ولي الصالحين وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله الأمين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون أما بعد All praise due to Allah We praise Him the way He deserves to be praised and we bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. He is alone with no partners. And we bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt his mention and grant him peace and send his salutations and his blessings upon him and upon his companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. O oh, you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear Him the way He deserves to be feared. And do not die except in the state of submission as Muslims. <coughs> Brothers in faith, the gift that Allah has given this Ummah is beyond what we can explain in human words. No matter what description and how well we articulate it and how eloquently we convey it we are simply unable to show what is due and what is rightful for the gift that Allah has given this Ummah and this gift is unique in so many ways because while it is similar to gifts that the previous messengers received, it has one quality that they all lacked. And that quality is that of preservation. And of course you know that I am referring to the Quran, the book of Allah. The book of Allah which becomes closer to us in the month of Ramadan than the rest of the year, no doubt. I think any one of us and every one of us will admit that his engagement with the book of Allah in the month of Ramadan is superior to the rest of the year. But I have news for you. And the news is that it's not enough. It's not enough. Our relationship with the Quran for the most part and I'm not generalizing but this is the majority is one of mere recitation it is recitation and that is something that believe it or not the people of the book were criticized for In their criticism, Allah says in the Quran, وَمِنْهُمْ أُمِّيُّونَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ الْكِتَابَ إِلَّا أَمَانِي And among them are those who are uneducated, illiterate. They know nothing of the book except recitation. They know nothing of the book except recitation. And today, if you were to grab the average Muslim by his shoulder and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with him, and I'm not going to make it sophisticated, just tell him to explain to you what does Allah Samad mean. Don't go far. Tell him what does that Samad mean. Explain the term. Translate the term. Define the term. For the most part, you will see jaws dropping and heads nodding. I don't know. 
You were born Muslim. Yes. Or you're a reaver to Islam. Yes. How many years? Ten years, five years, one year. And Surah Al-Ikhlas, which constitutes one-third of the Qur'an. It is equivalent to one-third of the Qur'an. Surah Al-Ikhlas with the few words it has. Because of the content, I will tell you the average Muslim has no idea how to explain it or understand it. Is unable to use it to give da'wah. Even though that surah in and of its own is the ultimate da'wah tool to the atheist and the Christian and the Jew and the Buddhist and the Hindu and every type of misguided human being on earth can be guided to Islam by Allah's will if you only knew how to convey to him or her Surah Al-Ikhlas. You see the reality then. While the recitation of the Book of Allah comes with its own package of reward, that we are all in need of. We are all in need of it. No one is beyond attaining more reward. No one can say, MashaAllah, I've done so much. I can, I can overlook this one. I can do without that one. No such thing. And the reason why, because you cannot look at things mathematically in Islam strictly. Because some people do, and that's naive. They say, brother, I prayed in the haram. And the salah is equivalent to 100,000 salah in the haram. And I prayed Isha, Maghrib and Isha and Taraweeh with the Imam. And so they look at it from a mathematical point of view. They say the good deed erases the bad deed. So no matter how bad I've been, technically speaking, I'm good to go. Technically speaking, you're not. Because none of us receives a receipt from the sky that says congratulations, your deeds have been accepted. So you can say, okay, it looks good for me. I'm ready to die. No one. Ibn Umar used to say, if I knew that Allah accepted only two rak'at, only two, I would have depended on them. Because Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلُ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Verily Allah only accepts the deeds of the righteous. He said that would make me among the muttaqin. Once I'm among the muttaqin, I am granted salvation. And that's Ibn Umar. What am I gonna say? What are you gonna say? And therefore this relationship of recitation strictly must stop. This attitude, this culture, this ideology of reading the book of Allah only so we can read it must stop. Otherwise there will be no progress. And I think a lot of us can admit that in our Ramadan there's no progress. It feels like last one and the one before, and the one before, and the one before. Some things just continue to repeat. No fundamental change. It's because our relationship with the Quran is foreign. And what is our excuse? I'm not an Arab. If Allah wanted me to understand the Quran, He would have made me an Arab. Since I'm not, there you go. I'm exempt from accountability and responsibility. Also not true. Two misconceptions. The first is that because a person is an Arab, they understand the Quran by default, wrong. The language of the Quran is not similar to the local dialects that the people speak. And while you will be able to understand many things because of the common terminology, it does not fulfill the objective of understanding the intent behind the ayah. 
Because for example in the Quran many times you come across the word dhan. Dhan and yaqeen. And many people when, when the local dialect when you speak dhan, by default it means assumption. It's a thought. It's a guess. While in the Quran in many occasions it means certainty. Which is the opposite, it's the antonym. Yaqeen is the antonym of dhan. But in the Quran, both are used to signify yaqeen and certainty. <laughs> you would think, and the person assumes that this is the time of death. No, dhan here he knows this is the time of death. And then the legs are crossed. Again, another indication that the person is in a state of weakness. An Arab may hear these ayat and still not understand what's going on. He will get the wrong interpretation based on the words. Face value. It requires an in-depth understanding. And this is why, my brothers in faith, we have to understand certain principles and once we understand them, then in the second part of the khutbah, inshallah, I will give you some practical solutions. The first fundamental principle is the statement of Allah, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayka bubarakun liyadabbaru ayatihi wa liyatadhakkara ulul albab. When Allah wanted to explain the purpose behind sending down the Quran, Allah clearly and explicitly said, Kitabun anzalnahu ilayk, a book which we have sent down upon you. And here the pronoun is in reference to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then comes the reason. ayatihi. So that they, now it's speaking about the plurality, meaning the whole mankind. Everybody, Muslims and non-Muslims. For the Muslims it means for Iman to increase, for the non-Muslims it means for them to find the truth. <laughs> so they may reflect on its signs. Whether ayat is in reference to the actual verses, or ayat could also refer to signs and miracles. And both are applicable to the Quran. وَلِيَتَذَكَّرَ أُولُوا الْأَلْبَابِ And those, and for those people of intellect, for them to be able to be reminded. So, so that they may be reminded. Who? The people of intellect. Not the one who can multiply three digits by three digits without using a calculator. That's not a person of intellect. And we got many scientists who don't know Allah. And in our definition, they're feeble-minded. Miskeen, he has a bird of a bird, he has a brain of a bird. If you don't know Allah, you have a brain of a bird. And it's gonna roast in Jahannam billah. It's not gonna save him. No PhD, no masters, no degree. It's gonna come and save somebody from disbelieving in their Lord. Well, the person whom we may consider to be miskeen and doesn't know much, if he believes in Allah, that is the intellectual person in reality. And that's the Islamic definition. And so Allah said that those people with the right intellect will be reminded via the Quran. <coughs> and news, if you just read the Quran five times in the month of Ramadan, five times from cover to cover, neither one of these reasons will apply to you. You cannot reflect on the ayat because you have no idea what you're reading. And you cannot be reminded because you have no idea what you're reading. You're going to get your 10 deeds, 10 good deeds for each half. But that's it. And that's not enough. Because that will make us under the criticism that the people of the book received. For having known the recitation, they know the tajweed and the ahkam. But there's no understanding. Further, Allah tells us 
إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوى. Verily, this Quran will guide to that which is most straight. Any time you have a conflict, any time you have two directions, you don't know in which one, which one to take, which one to go. Then know that the Quran will guide you to that which is most straight, the most away from crookedness. Is the book of Allah. There's no we judge. There's no crookedness in the Quran. It is straightforward in terms of guiding us to what is pleasing to Allah, knowing the purpose of life, understanding Jannah and its naim and its beauty and its bounties, and feeling the hellfire and its torment and its pain, understanding what the prophets in the past had to go through, the mission of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the affair of the people on Yom al Qiyamah. All of these matters are in the book of Allah. And if we read it without understanding, we will not attain the objective for which it was sent. For how long are we going to be lazy? For how many years are we going to be lazy? For how long are we going to postpone this? Later, or next year, or next month, it's time to change. And I will give you practical solutions in doing that. And the second khutbah, insha'Allah, aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Many people complain about smartphones and those electronic gadgets and devices. And they are quick to criticize them. And sure, they are deserving of the criticism. But the truth of the matter is, those devices can also be extremely useful if we know how to use them in a manner which is pleasing to Allah. And not to take anybody from the recitation of the Quran and the actual book because I know a lot of people get sensitive about this stuff and this sensitivity is uncalled for. You'll be reading the Quran from your smartphone and someone has to come and say, stop, read the book. Why? Why? What's your reason? It just feels right. Maybe that's how you found your forefathers. I understand that that's how you found your forefathers, but at your forefathers' time there was no smartphone. And actually these smartphones can be very useful in the sense that you have access to ample information that you may not have in the actual book. And it's physically with you wherever you go. So you don't have to restrict your recitation of the Quran to when you're in the masjid. And you don't have to have wudu. Because wudu is necessary for holding the book of Allah, but it is not necessary for holding a smartphone. So whether you believe it or not, it actually opens up certain doors for knowledge acquisition that otherwise are not available in the traditional book. And if you prefer it, by all means, knock yourself out. But don't be among those who want to criticize people just because you feel a certain way. Our religion is not based on feelings. Because I can tell you now, similarly, if you need a fatwa, and you can find it online on a reliable website, no brother, just go to the sheikh. He's a dead man. Book a flight, go look for the sheikh in the streets. Why read this fatwa online? This is convenience. And our deen is not about convenience, it's about complication. Don't speak to your parents on the phone to keep the kinship ties. Don't Skype. Go over there. You cannot make the religion like this. You cannot complicate the religion because you feel that there's a pressing need to do so. 
Don't worry, ya akhi. Allah preserved this book. Allah is not waiting for us. This book has been preserved by Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. Whether you read it from here or from there, it's not going to change anything. But if you know how to utilize these smartphones, then they are good. there's good news for you. <laughs> My recommendation for the month of Ramadan, if you have a smartphone. If you don't have a smartphone, don't worry about this conversation. Go buy a physical book. Download the translation or the tafsir of the Quran in your local language. If you have a Quran application, I will suggest one. It's called Quran Android because I've tried it, I've tested it, I know it's reliable. Download it and go to the translations in the settings and download the translation of Sahih International if you prefer to speak English. Be careful of all the available options. Not every translation is accurate and sound in terms of Aqidah and understanding. So the top recommended one is Sahih International. In Urdu, I believe you, and I might mispronounce the name is Muhammad Juragandi. Something like this. This is the one where the people that did the translation follow the way of our righteous predecessors. Because when you come to certain ayat that speak about the, the, the names and attributes of Allah, you don't want some funny guy mistranslating the book of Allah. A lot of them play with that. Those with whose aqidah is off, the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they mistranslate certain words. Download the tafsir. It's a few megabytes. And do yourself a favor. Stop worrying so much about the khatma. You're not Ibn Mas'ud, you're not Ibn Abbas. You're not Imam al-Shafi'i. You're not these people that had understood the book of Allah so well, they afforded to read it more than once because they already understand. They spend their life understanding. Me and you, we understand very little. Don't be overwhelmed with, I need to finish the Quran. Be overwhelmed with, I need to understand what I'm reading. So open up the application and read the ayah in Arabic and then give yourself some time and do yourself a favor and press on the translation. Read what Allah is saying to you. The understanding of one ayah is superior to reading the whole book of Allah with no understanding. Like a doctor can memorize a book of medicine in a foreign language, if he doesn't know how to apply this knowledge, he is a useless doctor. But he could understand one operation from it and use it to save someone's life. You tell me which is more important. We will all agree it's about understanding. So whether you speak Tagalog or English or Urdu or Hindi, there are sound translations by Allah's grace all over the world. Please, read. If you're going to a masjid where the Imam is trying to, is going in some sort of order, meaning you know what he will recite this night because he's following a particular order, it would be so wonderful if you can beat him to the task by reading the interpretation of what will be recited that night so that for once, when you're standing in Taraweeh, you have an idea what's going on. For once, you can connect with something he says. For once, maybe you will shed a truthful tear. Not one because others are crying. One because you understood what Allah said to you. You owe it to yourself. If you've been a Muslim for more than six months, let alone six years or 60 years, you owe it to yourself to stand once in Taraweeh and understand what in the world is going on. Where your focus is not how much your legs hurt and how long the Imam is taking and what you're going to be eating after the Salah and what type of shopping and errands you have to run. For once, you owe it to yourself to truly stand between Allah's hands in Salatul Taraweeh. Then you will know the sweetness of Ramadan.
Otherwise, it's a bunch of rituals. Any Tom, Dick, and Harry cannot eat from Fajr till Maghrib. Anybody can fast for the sake of their health. They don't have to believe in Allah. That doesn't make us special. It's what we attain with this month of Ramadan. From attaining taqwa and understanding the book of Allah, connecting with our Creator. This is the real taqwa that we attain at the end. And because we usually fail, from day one, from the day of Eid, people stop praying, they change their outfit, the women start getting naked, running in the streets, and the husband's walking right next to her. It's okay, because it's Eid. All the taqwa is down the drain. It ended with, with the last night of Ramadan. And it's the same cycle year after year. Then we look around and wonder, why are the Muslims suffering? Oh my God, the non-Muslims are hurting us. We're being beat. We need to go and fight them. Fight who? Fight what? Like this? You think Allah is going to put victory on our hands? Look at us. Can we compare ourselves to the Sahaba? They wouldn't. They would not go beyond certain ayat until they understood what they meant and they applied them in their lives. They wouldn't even memorize the Quran. Memorization. They were afraid to memorize and not apply. It would become a hujjah against them, a proof against them. They would not exceed a number of ayat, 10 ayat, until they knew everything that was related to them. Then they would move to the next 10. Now we have Hafaz and Qurra as much as you want. No idea what they're saying. The ritual of Taraweeh with the ritual of the Imam screaming his lungs out in the dua which is against the Sunnah with the ritual of all of us screaming I mean louder than him and of shedding a few tears and khalas. This is our Ramadan year after year. This has to stop. We can't keep bluffing ourselves. I beg you for the sake of Allah to take those actions. Don't feel guilty for using a smartphone. Instead of using it for useless information, you're using it to worship Allah. This is an ibadah, this is an ibadah. There's nothing, nothing whatsoever that prevents you from doing it. You can bookmark, every time you reach an ayah, you bookmark, you can refer to it later. It's ease, Allah made things easy for us. And there's no harm for you to accept ease. The scholars say if you have a hajj, if you want to go on hajj, and you have a, a, a hamla, a campaign that is fancy, decent, and one that is terrible and you can afford the expensive one, you go for the expensive one. You don't say, I want to go and suffer. You don't choose suffering. If it happens, Alhamdulillah, you have patience and perseverance, but you don't select it. The Prophet ﷺ was never given a choice between two things, except that he chose the easier option, unless it is haram, in which case he was the furthest away from it. You have many options. Use the one that is most practical and useful to you, but use it. Let this Ramadan, or what is left of Ramadan, let it become in your favor. You will feel delightful, delighted, when you read a book of I, a, bo a book, an ayah and the book of Allah, I apologize. When you read an ayah and you understand it, then you hear it in the salah. Wallahi, it is pleasure, it cannot be expressed in words. This is how your iman will grow. This is how your love for Allah will increase. This is how your relationship with the Quran will improve. This is the real solution. Everything else is a bunch of gimmicks. Don't deprive yourself. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make it easy for all of us. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub Thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub Israf qulubana ala ta'atik. ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم ارض عنا أجمعين وتب علينا واغفر لنا وللمسلمين والمسلمات والمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم اجعلنا من عبادك الصالحين وأوليائك المقربين وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم Allahumma salli wa sallim ala nabiyyana Muhammad. Brothers, before we begin the salah, uh, they inform me in the masjid that they are offering iftar every night or every evening in this masjid for around 80 to 90 people. 
on daily basis they're being offered iftar. So whosoever wishes to volunteer and partake in feeding uh, those brothers in faith, then this would be ideal. And also for those who have a kafara, those of us who are unable to fast for some chronic illness, a person who's unable to fast for some chronic illness or for certain pregnant women and so on and so forth, depending on the opinions of the scholars, then that person who may not make up the days that they miss, they are obliged to feed a person for each day. And so you can actually do the math and find out how much it costs for these 80 people and then you pay for 30 of them if you're not going to fast a whole month or if you're paying on behalf of your wife or your father or somebody. This is one of the useful ways to fulfill the right of Allah and help the needy people at the same time. Because it is an obligation on those who are not fasting to make up for that. If they can't make up the day, they have to pay. They have to feed a person for each day that they don't fast. So this is a useful occasion to do so. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make it easy for you. You can speak to the brother after the salah.